So when we fire this guy up, look at how broad that is. And just look at this, look at the inside of this case. It's literally a fog, a cloud. We're here on the dynamic bench. Uh, we've got everything up to temp, ready to crank about 500 horsepower worth of air. That's about 640 CFM. Let's make some noise. That was awesome. Thank you. It's so much fun. Hi, I'm Kirk Miller from AEM Electronics. What we're going to be talking about today is our water methanol injection system and some of the changes that we've made over time. The system that people purchase today is our V3 system. We're referring to it as a V3 system. Part number hasn't changed, but like a lot of our products, there's constant evolution. Within this kit is a third generation water pump, which is now waterproof, we'll get into that. A third generation nozzle, which again, we'll get into, uh, some of the, the key features and benefits of that. And then also the controller itself, it's actually, we've had two iterations of controllers. We had a V1, now we have a V2, but even in that product, there's constant evolution and updates going on inside to make the product more robust or to respond to feedback from our customer base. This is part number 30 dash. 3300. This is the boost reference kit, so you'll see a boost line off the bottom of the controller designed for forced induction vehicles. Another step of evolution is the packaging itself. We have problems with uh, shipping damage to packages so that the packaging itself has become substantially more robust to protect the tank, the fittings, and the pump in particular. Another change in this kit was going to a larger tank. We had a one gallon tank before. This is a 1.15 gallon tank. With this, we've made the change twofold. One, we moved the sensor up a little bit because we're capitalizing on the increased volume from one gallon to 1.15, so about 15% increase in capacity, but also having the fitting directly out the bottom of the tank, as you can see there, and then the fitting up high. So once your low fluid signal starts to come, you still do have reserves, but it's something that you have to pay attention to and reduce the opportunity for any starvation. In addition to that change, the fluid level sensor itself. We used to have a little flute that swung up and down, and if someone altered the angle of it, it could impin change the angle and the float itself might not work. And a float sensor, I guess the easiest way to say it, we found that there were some inconsistencies in its performance. So what we went to was like most contemporary cars now in their coolant uh, reservoirs have a, a conductive sensor. So when there's fluid in contact, it's seeing that it's a closed circuit, you have fluid in the tank. If it sees air, so if the two prongs are open, you break the continuity, now you have an open circuit, you have low fluid. So no moving parts, just a substantially more reliable part. The pump, historically, we recommend mounting in a cabin away from environmental. Uh, water, road debris, snow, rain. Now we've gone to a waterproof pump. So now this can be mounted in the engine bay. Uh, think of a pickup truck where the, the frame rail is an awesome place for positioning the pump. This can be mounted in that and you have no concerns of water intrusion or corrosion or anything like that. So it's a really nice update. And again, all of these changes that we've made over the years, no price change, same price. So you're, you're winning. Next, the bits. Boost line, corrugate it, protect your wiring. I used a lot of our competitors' products throughout my life. I gotta tell you, one of the most frustrating things is that you're in your driveway doing your install and you're 85% done to realize there's, there's not a bolt or a zip tie or something like that that's really simple and basic that you feel like, why, why wasn't that included in the kit? Now you have to stop your build, either go to your toolbox or your supplies in your garage or worse off, go to the auto parts store or hardware store to pick up a couple of zip ties to make the install clean. We include everything. So when you Open up the hardware. There's a tremendous amount of hardware here for mounting the tank, the pump, big flat washer, sheet metal screws, and nuts and bolts that are all set up. They're zinc plated, so you don't have to worry about rust over time. And again, it's everything you need in the kit in one shot. You have zip ties, an abundance of those, and then in the small bits bag, you have your LED, which can be mounted up in the dash that gives you a system status. When it starts injecting, it lights up for you, so you always know the system status if you have your controller stashed in the glove box or someplace else. Again, a complete kit. You don't have to worry about going anywhere for any parts. This is another little thing that makes a big difference. If you can see it, it's actually a, a, a little piece of molding that has a split in it. So if you're passing your, your lines through the, the body of the vehicle and you have a rough cut or a sharp edge, you don't want to worry about, again, hacking a wire or splitting a line. This actually 
lets you protect the area where the hose is going to pass through so you don't have to worry about any abrasions or anything. Or one of the last parts is the, just the connector for the fluid sensor. Our harness that comes with the kit is referred to as a flying lead. It makes it really nice that you don't have to splice in an ad wire lamp. I believe this is 11 feet in length. Everything is color coded. And what's really nice is the controller itself actually tells you all the colors of the wires and where they're, where they're going and what they're doing. Then, high pressure line. This is 20 feet of line. It's good for 300 PSI. It's a nylon type. It'll hold up to methanol and water with no problems at all. A reminder, never exceed 50-50 with methanol. Methanol burns clear, so this is a safety, safety comment, my PSA. Everything can handle 100% methanol, don't do it. Keep it at a 50-50 so it's non-flammable and safe. And it's still most efficient that way as well. It's not just a fuel, it's actually have the advantages of the water injection as well. This is the controller in this little box, which is a box and a box and a box. So it's well protected, it's, it's wrapped in bubble wrap as well, and you get to see the actual boost reference line on the base. Two knobs, really easy to move. They are resistance, there's resistance built into them, so they're not gonna move on their own as a result of vibration. And you have a boost onset, and then a finished boost. And all that's really saying is, when do you want this to start? And then at what pressure do you want 100% of your, your duty cycle out of your pump? So that's saying, what's your, when do you want everything? if needed. And if you don't, just set this above it, you only have a percentage of the max capacity. So that will get into the tuning of it as well. Across the bottom, kind of cool, there's a test button, then there's an LED status light. Um, I mentioned that we actually have two status lights on this. We have one that can be mounted up in your dash, and then if this is mounted in your glove box, the status light's not gonna do a lot of good because you can't see it. Uh, but in the event of something going sideways, whether you run low on fluid, you have a line fractured, you have an open or short circuit, there's literally trouble codes in this. So it has internal diagnostics and there's a really nice little chart right across the bottom that tells you what everything does. What is the air code? How many flashes? And then you have some diagnostic directions. Nine times out of 10, you're gonna be out of water, water methanol. But uh, in, in other events, this will give you some direction to start troubleshooting. On the back, I mentioned you have all your color codes for your wires and where they connect to, which, which component they actually go to. And then also, there's an external fuse. So if something, again, gets shorted out, everything's right here in one spot. So it's super convenient to work with. You know, in, in the, again, in the name of consistency and reliability, one of the other changes that we made to this controller was actually a positive locking connector. So when the connector comes in, you know A, that it's gonna stay in, and you can actually hear it. It snaps in, and it's a nice positive lock and a really nice fit. And the pin size is adequate for the, the current draw that we're gonna see on these pumps. You're gonna see you know, up to 10, 10 amp draw. That's pretty substantial. You always wanna have the boost reference after the throttle body. The reason for that is, is that on smaller displacement with high efficiency turbochargers, these things, you can actually run charge to pressure pre the throttle body that's fairly substantial. You can see 10, 12 PSI. That's not what the engine's seeing. That's what the charge tube is seeing. So you always want to have an actual reference of what the engine is actually going to see. So think of the map sensor, it's not reading off your charge pipe, it's reading off of the intake manifold. That's where this needs to be tapped into. One of the most exciting parts about some of the changes is the V3 nozzle. So historically we have a, a jet tip that you might be familiar with and a little billet body. We've gone away from the tip and we've introduced something called the swirl generator. Outside of it offering better atomization, which is what you really need, you want that fine fog because you have a short time to go from atomization to vaporization. And what's critical there is that you have really good distribution in your manifolding as well. The other part of it is simplicity. There's a check valve, there's a filter, and then down at the very base is sort of the, the key to this is a swirl generator. There's three different generators included. There's one that's mounted in, and then there's two other small ones in here as well. They're all different sizes. It's a 250, a 500, and a 1000. Super simple connection, push in, lock, it's done. That's your install to take it apart, collapse that, and slide it back out. Taking it apart, I'm gonna put it up on this dark area so you can see it a little better. There's a clip here that holds in the top, and this is another really trick piece. This is called an umbrella valve, and it's a check valve. What it does, it's actually self-cleaning. So if you do have some debris that comes to the system, the umbrella is inclined to let the debris pass through and not get stuck up in the check valve. So that's another massive improvement. Just beyond that is the filter, so you don't have to worry about the debris getting into the nozzle tip itself or stuck in the swirl generator. The filter itself is gonna capture it. So I'll slide this back about a little. You can see here's the filter that sits just below the umbrella valve, and then internally, there's a, some design features in here that do create better atomization than our earlier iteration nozzles that we have here. So you can see them side by side, definite difference in the way they look, 
and then disassembly and assembly, there's no comparison to how simple this is to get apart. Now we're gonna get to the bench and show you how this actually works. Compare it side by side, you'll see it. So this bench right here is what we refer to as our static bench. So it allows us to, to witness the nozzle atomization so you can see the fog that comes out of it and actually the, the pattern itself to see how broad or how narrow it might be. So in it right now is our 250. So in the back of the unit, there's a little inline filter. This goes between the tank and the pump. And what it'll do is it'll reduce any opportunities for debris to get into the system. It's got a stainless steel filter that's easily serviceable. This cap actually spins off. It's a little canister type filter in there. It's stainless steel, it'll filter down to a, the size of about 15 microns. This actually keeps all the big debris out of the pump, out of the nozzle, out of the system, out of the solenoid. The other part that we introduced only about a year ago, and it's really popular now, is the inline solenoid. In all cases, we recommend that the pump and tank are always mounted below the nozzle to reduce the opportunities for siphoning. So there is a check valve in the nozzle itself, but who knows what situation may arise where you have to worry about the system to begin siphoning from a full tank and actually bleeding through the nozzle. To prevent that, we've got the inline check valve like we mentioned in the nozzle itself, but further insurance on that, if you have to mount the pump and the tank above the nozzle or you have to mount the nozzle behind the throttle body, that means in the intake manifold where it's gonna see high levels of vacuum on D-cell, it is critical that you have an inline solenoid. This completely shuts the flow off to the system once the system is disabled or shut off. Highly recommend it for a situation where you have the pump tank higher than the nozzle itself. Okay, so as mentioned, this is our static bench. You'll notice there's a number of gauges and valves, and this is all to measure, and again, to quantify everything that we think is happening, is happening. Right here, this little rotary switch here is gonna just turn the valve on. We're gonna see the spray pattern. We're gonna see the atomization, and this is our 250cc nozzle. So you can see that the pattern and the, and the actual angle itself. When you compare the, the V2 to the V3, you're gonna see a wider pattern. With the same amount of fluid, what that's gonna tell you is that just as a result of the wider pattern, by default, you're gonna have better atomization because you're creating a larger area. I wanna to get to the V3. Again, this is static. We're gonna show you the dynamic that I mentioned earlier where it's actually moving the air through. There's about 600 horsepower worth of air moving through a charge pipe and it's heated. So you can actually get to see what this spray pattern looks like in that hostile environment. All right, so we're gonna change out from the 250 V2 to the 250 V3. Again, with the push-pull connectors, this is so simple. You just collapse the little collar, slides right off, bring your other one up, push it in, seat it, you're done. That's the swap. Okay, so you saw the pattern earlier. It, was, it, was, it wasn't narrow, it was, a, it was a good pattern, excellent atomization, but here's the changes. So when we fire this guy up, look at how broad that is, and just look at this, look at the inside of this case. It's literally a fog, a cloud, filling up this whole case right now. You didn't see that before. And what that's telling us is we just have better atomization. And that's all the work that's gone into that little swirl generator we talked about, and all those little different angle features that we have, that's gonna give you these results. There's a massive difference in the way these two perform. So what this is gonna show, we're gonna prove on our dynamic bench, where we have the airflow and we have the heat, we're actually gonna data log and display and show you how quickly the temperature comes down, your charge air temp comes down. We're also gonna show you how much fluid is required to make that happen. There's a massive difference between V2 and V3, and that's really what comes in for you. When you're using this system, how quick can it cool down, and how much fluid am I gonna use? So if you can use less fluid and have a quicker response, it's win-win. Okay, so as mentioned, we're, we're here on the dynamic bench. Uh, we've got everything up to temp. We've got our awesome test equipment off to the back, the secret stuff, ready to crank about 500 horsepower worth of air. That's about 640 CFM, a little bit above that. Uh, we have temps up over 275 coming through with the preheater. We have our we're monitoring CFM with, with our flow meter. We have a K-type thermal couple. We have several of them through this path. We have one pre-injector nozzle, one post-injector nozzle. And then you'll notice we have one all the way in the back here in our Flowmaster muffler. And that's to make sure that we don't get any phantom readings from a wetted temp sensor. So the K-type sitting back here is guaranteed to stay dry. And it's actually giving you what the temperature is post-injector nozzle. So we're gonna crank this thing up. You're gonna see all this airflow. You're gonna hear a lot of noise coming through. But most importantly, what you're gonna see, what I said earlier when we started, the whole mission here was to do more with less. Less nozzle, less injection, less fuel. And you're gonna see a quicker drop. So we're monitoring all that through our CD7, logging all of these sensors. And then we're gonna actually post this, actually be able to witness the quicker temp drop between our V2 and V3 injection nozzle and then see what the actual temp drops are and the time it takes to make that happen. 
So with all that being said, let's make some noise. So, a lot happened right there, a lot. And you saw the injection nozzle, you saw the spray pattern coming out, you can see at the exact exit out here, and we can guarantee that this guy's a dry sensor, so you don't have to worry about it being wetted and giving you a phantom temperature drop. And then you saw some of the action here on the, on the CD7, but most importantly, post. We're gonna analyze the data, and we're gonna give you screen caps to show you everything that you just saw happen in a more controlled atmosphere. Pretty cool stuff. Okay, well, I hope you learned a few things about water methanol injection and our continued evolution of development and a few things about some of our newer technologies, our V3 injector nozzle. If you liked what you saw, please hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and then hit the bell to get notifications of new videos posted by us here at AM Electronics. Started sweating. Does anyone do the thing? Thank you. So I'm from New Jersey. When we say water, not water. How do you guys say it? Water. Water. <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you. It's so much fun.